Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Lance, how are you today? Doing excellent. How are you? I'm doing well. Today, we have a pretty fun conversation with a friend and a blogger named Aurelia, who has been writing about the Maura Murray case for a while now. Yeah, I, I feel like once a month, we reach out and we say, hey, we got to have you on the show. Let's schedule it. And then something comes up and and we have to keep bumping her back. Uh, but we finally got her on. And it's a yeah, it's a really fun conversation. It's light. We read some emails. And there's an email in there that I really want to make sure the person who wrote it hears it. It's sort of an apology for uh, something that I the way I described something on one of the previous episodes. And we want to invite you to check out our new podcast, Crawl Space. Episode four is coming out this week, and we go deeper into a story that we bring up in this episode that you're about to hear. You'll know the story when you hear it. It's about our trip to Vermont uh, a couple of weeks ago. And also next week, we're going to put out an interview with a very interesting guy named Todd Matthews. He's the director of NamUs, National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Here's a very quick clip of something he had to say during that interview. Missing is worse than dead, so I do know that. I, I think humans can deal with the final chapter, we're all going to die. Uh, we, we have a way, a mechanism in your body. Uh, in your mind, we deal with it. You, you grieve for three days, you have to deal with it. It's not easy and you never forget, but you are able to move on. Families that have missing persons, they don't get that final disposition. We are not programmed to not know what happened. It's easier to know that somebody's dead, you visit the grave and it's a natural part of life than to just be absent with no explanation whatsoever. Okay, and let's roll the interview with Aurelia. Thank you very much for listening. Follow us on Twitter. We're on Instagram and Facebook as well. And check out blueapron.com slash missing and get your first three meals free with free shipping. Thank you very much. Really, welcome to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. How are you? I'm doing well. It's been a uh, it's been a little bit um, in the works having you on the show. We kind of got sidetracked with uh, certain things that are going on with the case, but we had wanted to have you on really early on since you started to first blog about the case. How did you discover the case? And I'm sure a lot of people ask you that now. Where where are you at with the uh, with the blog? As for discovering the case, that was four years ago on TV. I saw it disappeared, and I only had seen it just once, and that was the, and then I just didn't hear about it for a couple of years. And then I researched a little bit right after Serial came out, and I got mini obsessed. And then months later, you came along. Based on what you saw in the Disappeared episode when you first hear, heard about this case, how has your opinion on the case changed since then a lot because there's a lot more voices on the case a lot of different backgrounds you know there are bloggers there's james renner who i hadn't known when i first watched disappeared there's people in the online community who discuss it i mean my theory was always the same but it's like it's really different when you hear from a lot of different voices because then you, you start to second guess and you know i'm not really from I'm not from New Hampshire. I've never been there, so I don't know what the area is like. Sometimes I hear stories about locals and stuff, people you've talked to, people who just, you know, comment online on Facebook. It's more eye-opening. Was there any part in your writing and your looking into the case that you thought you might be getting in a little too deep? That you no. might have been a little too obsessed? Because you said you were a little obsessed, right? <laughs> no, We're no, all a little cause... obsessed. Yeah, I, d I became obsessed, but I never got in deep. In deep is me, like, booking an air ticket to New Hampshire and going to the site. That's on another level. Like, I want to do that, but I can't. And also, you know, I have respect, you know. But <laughs> well, that's your that's your version of in too deep. Uh, our version of in too deep might be if you start a blog about the case. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's not in too deep. When did you make the decision to start writing a blog about the case, about Moore Murray's case? And what what was it in your head? I know you said that you discovered it a few years before you listened to the podcast. Was it just because 
you felt that there was the podcast and there was uh, James Renner's blog. Um, and at that time, I believe there were some some unmentionable trolls out there writing about it. Were you just like, I need to be some sort of voice of a different voice, a female voice? I didn't even think about it as a female voice. It's just that I was really glad that somebody was talking about the case. Like, you have to realize in 2015 when you came out, um, the year before Serial was big, right? And that's when I was introduced to, like, true crime podcasts. And for, like, almost a year, like, eight months, that's that case of Adan Sayed was the only thing I was talking about online. So I was just glad, like, something that was serialized was in the picture again. And that was more Marie's case. I didn't expect to write many, many blogs about it, but I just wanted to make a start. Well, the blog entries that you that you submitted are different than what we're used to when we read others or we read emails where people break down the the investigation you took it from a really almost personal or emotional place it's a, i guess a little emotional cuz i'm in the same age range that Mara was when she vanished so i feel like i could discuss a little bit about that i mean i didn't go through the same life experiences as her so yeah it's a little personal yeah, and whether it was intentional or not, you were one of the first female voices that people heard. Because before then, it was James Renner, it was Tim and myself, and it was just a bunch of guys talking about what a female might do. And, I mean, people were correct when they emailed us or commented on uh, on, on the podcast about, you know, guys, you... You, you can't possibly know what's going through her mind. And it's true, you can't um, as, a, as a male, you know, a, a late 20s male. You couldn't possibly, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't possibly know what's going through uh, a 21-year-old female's mind. But what are we missing as men um, that, that you can add? Like, uh, like specifically, like... About like, the case, not just in general. <laughs> yeah, like what is it that we're missing? Like, um, you know... One thing that we talk about is we don't really understand what it's like to be in fear of your safety because we're men. We don't we don't think like that. We don't go out to a bar, go for a walk down the street at night with my dog. Like I don't think, oh, I got to be worried for my safety. But as a woman, you maybe have to, or at least have to think about it a little bit differently than than we do. Yeah, it's constantly on my mind anytime I leave my home. What if this person standing next to me? I don't know, I'm waiting to get a ride home is going to kill me. Or, or what if the car I'm driving, like, you know, I accidentally crashed it, even though I've been, th been through that before. But, uh, um, yeah, it's something that weighs on my mind. It's a real thing. The first time I watched Disappeared and I saw pictures of that, of her car, I was like, I got chills. I'm like, oh, my God, abduction. You know, it's... Like, it seems obvious to me, so it's like, when you're, put, when you're put in tricky situations like that, it's it raises the stakes, I don't know. And your thinking isn't rational um, all the time, as uh, we actually just experienced recently, which uh, maybe we'll get into in a little bit. But um, do you still feel the same way about the Moramari case? Do you still feel like she was abducted? Yes. Now, one of the things we're going to do in this episode is read some emails, um, and we put the call out there to our listeners a couple weeks ago through Twitter. If you have any questions for us for this episode, please feel free to send them. Um, we got one from someone named Eric who mentioned confirmation bias, the, the concept of confirmation bias and how we've never really named it. But it's essentially when you have a theory or have a thought or something you think happened to Mora, and then you kind of work backwards um, sort of like in the way you just did. So I guess I wanted to read this email, but I also wanted to ask you this question. Do you feel like you're biased in your confirmation? Like, do you feel like that was what you first 
thought of the case when you saw the pictures that there was an abduction and then everything you've heard since then confirms that does that mess with that or can you see that you're being that you're thinking clearly about the case at this point or do you think you are i can see that you know encountering the other subjects that you've interviewed yeah it does mess with my head but i'm still still hold that firm belief in the first theory because it I, I just think like with James Renner's theory, it just doesn't apply at all. So what you're essentially doing, and I just want to thank Eric for that email, because we do talk about this confirmation bias, but we talk about it in a way where we say you, you're bending the narrative to fit your own theory. Um, yeah. And I honestly didn't know that that was called confirm- <laughs> confirmation bias. Um so what you're what 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 you're in a sense doing is you're looking at the most logical outcome based on the facts that you've put together and you have the other theories that are there but you're using the same tools to rule those out as you're using to or as you're applying to your theory but they are proving your theory and ruling out the other theories does that make sense I wasn't listening, um, <laughs> but maybe Aurelia can answer. <clears throat> just say, just say that is here. Just, just say this. <laughs> that is exactly the way I would have said it, Lance. Thank you. That is exactly the way I would have said it, Lance. Thank you. I was, I was talking to her. Mm. Yeah, that that was a little complicated. Um, <laughs> you can say it too. <clears throat> no, I'm just. It's it's just different with me. Like the other stuff doesn't apply. But then when this podcast came out, like, that's the first time I heard people mention, oh, she walked into the woods and she died there. I never even considered that before. And then there's the running away, which is what James likes to say. But and he likes to hold down the 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 pregnant theory. Right. And we've we've brought that up with with James as well about, you know, that means there's somebody helping her. That means that somebody else is is staying quiet and in order to do that, the circumstances have to be so extraordinary and severe. And yeah. why is there no evidence of any circumstance that's extraordinary and severe? And what he brings up is the pregnancy and and it's Bill's kid and she doesn't want Billy to be a part of it. And that is somebody forcing their their narrative. Let me let me ask you a question um, as a uh, as a young woman. I'm not going to pretend to be a young woman that came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm a young woman. No. Uh, let me ask you a question. You being a young woman, does it make sense for her to be pregnant and still carry tampons and birth control with her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's still practical. But it doesn't really imply anything that she's just carrying stuff around. I don't know. Gotcha. It doesn't really explain much. It's just tampons and birth control. Yeah. As far as dying in the woods, more you mentioned uh, you mentioned Mora going out and and dying in the woods. Um, she would have had to have chosen to to freeze to death, right? We we were out in Vermont this past weekend and uh, we got stuck in the snow actually, and we needed to rely on the help of the person who was closest to us. Our, we were out of service, the car was stuck, and we had to approach a random house. And how odd that it happened to us after covering this case for so long. We were put in almost an identical situation as Mora. The only thing different really was that we were together. There was three of us. And still, we weren't thinking clearly. I think that's important to know. We got stuck in the snow and then we all said, well, let's keep going forward instead of going back and try to get past this. When in reality, what an awful decision that was that we all made. We all agreed on that. So none of us were thinking clearly. And then Chloe, our co- our co-host on Crawl Space, she's like, all right, guys, I'm just going to walk up here and go to this nearest house. And we're like, uh no, you're not going anywhere without us. Like, what are you thinking? So <laughs> it's actually, uh, it's shocking how, how not clearly we were thinking, but thinking we were acting rationally. Tim and I were, there were these snowmobile like trail markers, these uh, wooden posts that we just pulled out of the ground, pulled out of the snow and and thought that we were, we were going to somehow dig the tires out 
Like it, we were, we were seriously about three hundred feet from. No, we were like exactly three hundred <laughs> feet from from the beginning of where the the this terrible area of snow started, and we had these like little posts, and we were trying to dig out the back tires and trying, you know, and using the whole like, well, rock it forward and backwards. It's like no, we're like yeah. we're li- I don't know if you saw the picture on Twitter, but we were. There's no way. There's yeah. the, and then even if we were to push it, it was like this this incline that. We never ever would have gotten no over. No way. It took but us a few. It took us almost ten minutes though to come to the realization that we were stuck, and we missed Brianna Maitland's vigil, her uh, the thirteen year anniversary. We were supposed to be up there in Enosburg Falls, and uh, we ended up uh, getting stranded an hour away from there, trying to pass through the mountain on on a road that was unpaved, but was actually packed with like three feet of snow still, and it hasn't snowed it, all that recently, but. Three to four to five maybe feet deep was this snow. Um, it was a way well above the guardrails, and we just didn't know it at first. Yeah, apparently it's the road that they shut down during the winter for snowmobiles, but they don't mark it that it's a snowmobile road, and and there's there's no signs indicating it. And it looks like it just looks like a layer of snow on a road when you drive on it until your car sinks down into it. <laughs> um, that's a really long story that <laughs> Well, I think it's I think it's good. I think the the audience will be interested in it. Oh yeah, I and, was going to say it's a long story to to show how you don't think clearly even as two, you know, late to mid 30s guys. Oh, I thought we were 20s. <laughs> I forget all the time. We we aged during this episode. We aged, yeah. Um I thought that I was thinking clearly and I just wasn't. And I couldn't imagine, I, I mean, now I can imagine what it would be like for someone like Mora being a young woman stopped there, like we're, hung up there. We're three smart people. We like to think we're three, we're smart people anyway, individually and certainly together. You put three heads together, that would be better than one person you'd think, but we still weren't thinking rationally. And uh, we, like I said, we had to rely on the kindness of whoever was around. And so we went to um, the nearest house and we met the Bizarro Westmans. Right. (laughs) The parallel universe Westmans, a couple that welcomed us, helped us out. And if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them, we would have been walking a couple of miles because they were, as they were driving us out to cell service, they were pointing out all the houses that the only neighbor was a 90 year old deaf man who doesn't answer his door a a former lawyer from philadelphia who is deaf and even if he heard you knocking he wouldn't answer the door oh my god yeah and and so these people and they had no landline so they had to drive us to cell service which which again we we interrupted their night they live in canada and they were going to drive back to canada that night we were lucky enough to catch them with their car running and we, but, but we did prevent them, them helping us prevented them from going back to their home, uh, that night in Canada. <laughs> so it, so th- they couldn't have been nice that night. Yeah. That happened uh, two nights ago. One thing that we always hear from our listeners about is how amazing Blue Apron is. They love it. They really do love it. And we've been getting just flooded with emails. It's a deluge of emails and the phone calls. Have, have you been getting the phone calls now? People just want to know, what is this Blue Apron? Yeah, they, they're they asking, are you guys serious when you, when you talk about Blue Apron? You can't possibly love it that much. Well, actually, we do. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. And there are a lot of recipe and ingredient delivery services in this country. This is the number one. Yeah, and it's so easy to cook. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients and can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. And the variety, right? You can choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or like I like to do, I let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise me. I like opening the box and seeing what they've come up with. Recipes are never repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. It's interesting that you let them do that. I I love to choose myself because I, I just have fun with that, so I, I choose. But I, I would like to be surprised at, at some point. Do you like surprise parties, things like that? No, but I am sort of like a mindless robot. So the less I have to think and the less somebody can do the work for me, 
that's the way I tend to operate. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash missing. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash missing. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And I know uh, one of your uh, blog entries, one of my favorite ones, is the one where you kind of go pseudo missing. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, tell us about yeah. that experience. I just didn't want to go home. I don't know. So I'm like, can I stay over? Uh, <laughs> and yeah, and then, you know, whatever. I fell asleep. And um, I didn't even bring my phone charger. So, but yeah, I expected like the next morning to get like a bunch of phone calls, you know miss phone calls and texts and um when i woke up i checked and it was like chaos <laughs> bunch of missed calls and all that and my strip telling me like where are you we're gonna call the police if you're not here by 12 so it was like damn oh okay so i called my mom eventually and she was really happy to hear from me and then i went home and we had like this like serious talk and um I also, like, I checked on Facebook that my sister had made, like, a post, like, have you seen her? And she put, like, a bunch of pictures of me. It was really surreal. Like, oh, oh my God. Like, if it went, like, super public, I would have died. But, you know what I mean? Like, calling police, putting your picture on the news, like, Did that's they file? something I couldn't handle. Did they no, file no, no. a missing persons report? No. No, I would have died. But, uh, <laughs> no, it could have happened if I was still not reaching them, you know? Yeah. So, I, I got to experience it a little because, like, I heard people were crying and, you know, people were making posts about me and, you know, they start to fear the worst. It's really real. So much time has been uh, wasted or, you know, so much time has been, has passed and you just, it, it feels even more desperate when you consider back in 2004 yeah when you when you consider it back in 2004 and and you're looking at it now and you you start thinking well all the time that they wasted but when you look at the police dispatch logs there's a line in there uh, has uh, has the, the the person has has a person arrived at the cottage meaning the cottage hospital so uh -huh. has has she shown up at the cottage and it's just funny that they you know, that's that's the way they were thinking, you know, well, maybe she just walked to the hospital or did someone drop her off at the hospital? Yeah. I wanted to read another email here. We got a uh, an email from Heather. She says, wanted to write you to tell you how much I've enjoyed the show. Started listening about two months ago and I'm now following Crawl Space. Thank you for doing a great job on these. Wanted to ask you about updates on your documentary, which we don't address much on the podcast, but we do get this question a lot. And the reason why we really don't answer it much is because it's hard to answer because... Uh, we don't have an answer. Um, we have an incredible amount of footage. We have three years of footage, and we are just really starting to dig in and form it as a movie. So uh, that's the only update we have. When we have more video to show you, that will you know we will put it out there. We're actually hoping to maybe have something to display at CrimeCon in June in Indianapolis. Um, so that is our, our half, you know, that is what we can answer now on that. Um, Heather also asks about James Renner archiving his blog and she says, I feel he would only do that if he found her. And what do you, what do you have to say about that? I know at face value, because he said, if he found her, then he would do this. No questions asked. Um, I don't think he would have come on our show. And, and said the things he said on um, if he found her and came on our show and is going to crime con and and is facing these questions I mean he's putting himself he's he's putting his career on the line for for someone who he's now protecting yeah the the quick answer is he has not found her if he had found her uh, there is other things going on right now behind the scenes that 
that it, it, it would have been known. We at least would have known about it. We wouldn't be sitting here right now saying, no, he didn't find her. But the answer is, no, he didn't find her. And he also said that he was writing a book, and he wrote the book. The book was based on his experience. His experience, from what he's told us with this, is for the most part over. He wants to, like you said, wants to get out of the true crime genre and and move into something that is a, a little bit more zen-like. Those were his words. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, it, it'd be nice. Maybe we're wrong, but I, I don't think he found her either. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I just think he has reached the end with that case. And I, I see he's moving on to things with TV and other writings. But I just think, like, it's, it's over with with him unless there's a huge development. And I think that's fine if he wants to archive the blog because there's nothing more to discuss. He, he was on it for like five years. Mm -hmm. what, what more is there to talk about, you know? I'm glad that he did it, actually. Yeah, we, we certainly aren't here to vilify him for archiving his blog. And uh, we, do, we hope other people uh, don't vilify him for archiving his blog either. Heather also mentions that she wanted to express uh, interest in our take on the Emma Philippoff case or the Elisa Lamb case. And we've actually given our opinion on the Emma Philippoff case on the Nighttime podcast with our buddy Jordan, a uh, Canadian podcast. It, really great. We had him on, the, on this show. I think it was episode 40 or 39. Um, but, uh, but if you want to hear, he, he's done four episodes, four or five episodes on Emma Philippoff and Lance and I appear twice to talk about our thoughts on Emma Philippoff. So you can check that out there. Yeah. And if you have any, if you are interested in Emma Philippoff, he is the, the, uh, you know, he, he is the podcast authority for it. Um, if you want to, if you want to reach out to us, to us and ask us about it, we're probably just going to direct you to him because uh, he is a good guy and he has uncovered a lot of really detailed information. The okay, actually, this is a, a decent little parallel. So the CBC documentary uh, about Emma Philippoff's disappearance focused on a suspect, and Jordan actually goes on to have this suspect, this guy named Julian, on his podcast and really clear the air. And anyone who's listened to that you're not going to hold Julian as a suspect. You're not going to think he's a person of interest anymore. But this news program really sort of pushed it because, well, heck, it's a news program. They have an hour or so. That's what they do. Similar to the disappeared episode on this case where they put out there, oh, Billy got this call and he heard breathing and we don't know what it is. And he swears it was Maura Murray. And we still get emails about that. What is that? What is that? Well, the work that we've done and, and with James, it's come up that that has nothing to do with Maura Murray. It's a call from the Red Cross. So you see how things get sensationalized in a quick documentary like that. But you really have to go deeper to find the truth. Right. When you're producing a, an expose like that and people say these things, they're going to be shot in like dim light from a, from a you know, from a, a menacing angle or something with this you know, Hitchcock music behind it. So, yeah, when they're showing when they were showing Julian and I remember watching that and just being like, they're, OK, he's he's the villain villain. He's right. the one that they're vilifying here. But, yeah, once you hear him on uh, Jordan's show, it's uh, I mean, he he definitely puts himself in the wrong place at the wrong times a couple of times. Um, but in retrospect, he, you know, he never knew. He didn't know what was going to happen. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would change change it all if he could. And uh, as far as the Elisa Lamb case goes, um, I really wanted to believe there was something supernatural or paranormal in that case, but I uh, don't feel that way. And I and uh, I think the Generation Y did an excellent episode on this. And uh, I know True Crime Garage covered it recently. I haven't listened to that yet, but it does seem to me that uh, that she had. Um, she got herself into that water tank herself. Yeah, and that the video of her in the elevator certainly looks like there's some sort of um, possession going on there. Uh, it, it's a really creepy video. Have you seen it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you, you, can, you can take a video of anybody on bath salts or you know something and you're gonna think that they're they're possessed it, it looks like somebody on drugs it looks like someone on drugs but that isn't that isn't even my theory or you know i, I think it's more like uh her her uh 
it was the age where maybe uh, a mental uh, incapability was showing and um, she ended up where she ended up and maintenance guy locked the water tank afterwards and it, and it makes it seem like she was put there by a ghost and the ghost locked it but I'm pretty sure that's not what happened actually I'm, I'm 100% sure a ghost uh, didn't lock that lock both cases like they have some similarities because they were both like not in their in their home state or whatever and well, one of them turns up dead, but still, it's like, I think about, like, the, oh, the dangers of traveling by yourself as a woman, and this is what happens when, when you don't look after yourself or whatever. I think what gets most people about that video is that it looks like she's running away from somebody. In the beginning of that elevator video, she's looking outside of the elevator and, and kind of, like, tucked in the corner a bit, and she presses every, every button. Uh, you know, it just makes it look like those moments in horror movies where they're in the elevator and someone's coming down the hall and, you know, she's pressing the buttons as frantically as possible. Uh, right. So it it had its uh, it had its 15 minutes of paranormal <laughs> fame, but I think it's uh, I think it's a lot more simple. Another email we got here from Jason. He says, based on your extensive research on the case, would you guys walk us through your three most likely scenarios and your percentage of likelihood of each. He says, for example, Mara was planning on getting away for a short time. When the accident happened, she was taken and ultimately killed by a predator who happened upon her, possibly from the houses nearby or a car passing or a member of law enforcement. And he puts 50% on that. And he says, number two, Mara always intended to disappear forever for whatever reason, pregnancy, abusive relationship, etc. She remains alive under an un under an assumed identity, he says 40%. And then he gives 10% of credence uh, for himself to Mora committed suicide. So those percentages were uh, were Jason's. Um, I don't want to give my percentages, uh, actually, to, to be honest, but... And, and, I, and I haven't really thought through it enough to come up with percentages like that. I would just say that all of them still are on the table i agree at this time i can't put any credence into percentages of any scenario it's not responsible to put that out there for anyone just joining the podcast to to hear um okay james call me you just set me up so you can call me james <laughs> well see i gotta cut that part and, yeah. then, <laughs> and then i'll get the joke in yeah. uh, okay another email we received is from somebody who prefers to remain anonymous, but it is a legit source. Um, and this is almost an apology, I guess, on my part, a correction, an apology. This email was titled Lico Kenny, and it was in reference to the episode we aired called Showdown in Franconia. He says, I'm a close friend, I'm a close family friend of the Kennys, and to call them countercultural and to live on a compound is a bit much and a little offensive. It's a farm, not a compound. Countercultural isn't an appropriate word. They were more free spirited, uh, do your own thing on a farm in the sticks, and minding their own business kind of people. Uh, renegades is not true at all. They had a problem with Bruce McKay due to the real harassment problem that was going on between him and their son. He had a history of harassment, whether it be documented or accounts from those who happened to be there. Everyone lost something that day. We all hurt. Careful wording next time would help. So if the person is listening who wrote that, I do apologize for the for presenting the, the Lico Kenny and the Kenny families in that manner. Uh, so thank you for the uh, correction on that. We got another email here from Lyle. A lot of great questions from Lyle in this email. Uh, so we'll try to answer a couple of them or at least bring them up and see what we can answer. Has the tow company ever been asked why they brought the car to their personal garage? And no, we don't have an answer on that. But we do have a bit of a clarification. This isn't a personal garage that you'd see in someone's home that's connected to their connected to their house. It was a, from what I understand, a garage that was on his property where he performed maintenance on cars and small engines. So small town, he was 
contracted by the police department to tow cars, they probably were aware that this was a secure location. Lyle goes on to ask uh, a question that we really can't answer. He says, because of Mora, how many people now have a respect and love for the White Mountains? He goes on to say that he was on the East Coast during a business trip, and if it weren't for this story, he would have just gone back home to the West Coast after his business, but he decided to drive by the crash site, and he understood why Fred and Mora fell in love with the White Mountains. And he says that it would be interesting to get people's take on on one thing that has changed people's lives because of Mora. So I think that is a really interesting point, um, how people's lives have been changed because of Mora. And, and it's 100% true. It's happened with us. Um, Aurelia, it may have happened with you. I know you've started writing more because of this case. So it is an interesting topic and something we should delve into a little bit deeper. So getting back to your blog, Aurelia, um, can you give us a couple of uh, entries that you've written that stand out that you're most proud of? And are there any other cases that you're planning on working on or you're just getting into? I wrote like a year's worth about Mora's case. So it's hard to remember, actually. <laughs> um, I remember um, there's one titled The MMM men and I remember it was right after your second spree cast my true crime addict post that was good another one of the posts that I that I really liked was when you went to that podcast meetup and who did you end up meeting there well it was it was for the sword and scale yeah so I met Mike who hosts that show I met Justin Evans from Generation Y and and actually met another uh host um her name is esther and she she does once upon a crime but when i met her i didn't know that she did that show because we just started talking and then at some point she revealed like she she does her own show i'm like oh that's you so (laughs) so yeah so technically i met three podcast hosts but yeah it was really cool that was my first meetup ever of that capacity um so you know, usually I keep it to the internet and I talk to people about cases, but that was the first time, like, meet someone face to face. We got a good inter- a good question here from Brittany. Brittany mentions um, the Lori Bruno interview and saying it was uh, controversial, uh, talks us about another psychic. Um, and uh, and also, we, we got a question, have we spoken with... Laurie Bruno since the original interview with her, which I think was episode seven. Um, we have spoken with her a few other times, actually, um, once on camera for the documentary. And once or twice, she just cold called me, um, which is always pretty interesting getting a cold call from a psychic and she just starts rattling into her thoughts right away. Um, but I'm not sure we're going to we're going to share those interviews on the podcast and we're probably almost definitely not going to get another psychic on the podcast. <laughs> um, but she, but uh, Brittany goes on to ask, are we ever going to make episode 18, Crossing the Rubicon, available again? And the, the quick answer to that is no. <laughs> What's the long answer? No. No. <laughs> That's the long answer. Uh, we we obviously we had a problem with this guy the the blogger we interviewed Aurelia you know uh, you know him uh, well and um, actually I believe you, you you might be responsible no no I'm just kidding <laughs> but uh, but I think you you introduced him to this podcast and uh, and so we had him on because he was 
Uh, he had some interesting thoughts. He started blogging about the case and then really turned on, not only on us, but on the listeners and on the Murray family in a way that was uh, extremely disrespectful in a way that we had to distance ourselves from him. We got messages from more than a few people on Twitter and emails saying that they were afraid of this person and asking us if he's any kind of threat. And, you know, do we know where he lives? Do we know his real name? Things like that. We did not give his name or dress out or knowledge like that out to uh, people who were asking. Um, but it clued us in on us really having to distance ourselves from that person. Yeah, it was a very reckless thing uh, for him to start doing that. Uh, and it was the responsible thing for us to take it down. We said that we probably would never take down an episode unless it was an extreme circumstance, and this was. Uh, all that being said, that's about as much time as I want to spend on him, unless you have something to say about him, Aurelia? No. Sounds good. <laughs> I do want to say that we did the episode featuring Lori Bruno. She is a psychic. We did it because um, she offers an alternative way of thinking about the case. We don't subscribe to the psychic angle that what she's saying is fact. She does allow you to think about it differently. And the Murray family uses psychics in their, uh, in, in their search for, for more as well. So we're not going to get into psychics again. We don't need to have four or five psychics saying the same thing about, cold water and shivering and being pulled into a truck. You pre-warned listeners that you'd have a psychic on. And I remember, because I, I, that was at the time that you would release it week, like every other Thursday, like each Thursday, right? And so when I heard that, I was like, because I don't, I, don't, I don't really like to hear about psychics either. But then when I heard that episode, it was actually really fun. It's just <laughs> like really lively and, and, and showy. I don't know. I just, actually enjoyed it oh, yeah well, and, and you know one one more thing on the psychic which you just reminded me when you said you know she was lively you enjoyed it any one of those people that criticized us for having a psychic on like i can't believe you guys buy into this first of all we said we right from the get-go we never bought into anything <laughs> but a lot of people criticized it every single one of those those people if they were sitting there with her when she was doing doing her thing would have been riveted yeah. I don't care what you hear about it after and you start, you know, picking it out and saying you're leading her. She's leading you. Like if you oh were sitting God. there, if you were sitting there in Salem, Massachusetts in her shop and she was you, she was doing what she was doing in front of you, you would you'd be glued to her. You'd be riveted by what she was saying. Yeah. And uh, and psychics, paranormal um, supernatural things. Th those are all mysteries, Bigfoot, things like that. I was way more into that before we started this podcast. And now, uh, now that we're do we do a couple of true crime podcasts, my, my brain, I don't have room in my brain to occupy those kind of thoughts and, uh, mysteries anymore. It's more of the, uh, the gr more grounded things like the Brianna Maitland case or, uh, more Amari case that the more you do it, I think you kind of, you kind of realize that magic isn't real. And uh, Elisa, you know, a ghost didn't lock, didn't lock that master lock, you know. But uh, five years ago, or when I first heard about the Elisa Lamb case, like, you know, I was using confirmation bias to say, yes, look, a ghost did lock that, you know. <laughs> she, yeah, I mean, we were having this conversation uh, the other day and how, how, like, almost liberating it is. And all a little, got a little embarrassing because I really want to believe that Bigfoot's out there. I really want to believe that you know these these cycle these paranormal things happen. But every every situation you can find the logical solution to the logical real life solution to. What's your uh, what's your where do you draw the line? Right at paranormal. Like no, I was gonna say I'm I'm not into that stuff. Paranormal, psychics, whatever. Like I just like zone out. But yeah, um, so I, I never apply that in any case I read I read about. Like if you know me, I, I just yeah, I'm pretty practical. Yeah, it seems there's not a lot of crossover between people who are really into true crime and people who are really into paranormal stuff. And uh, and I didn't really get that until we started this. 
for the record, I got it the entire time. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess th- that's pretty much it. Before we uh, wrap up, is there any case that that you're uh, that you'd like to feature that that you're uh, you're writing about or? I would in? like to shout out um, Annie McCann, and I wrote about her case last summer on Detalk Talk Radio. Um, just to go into it, she was a girl from Virginia, and um, she was a junior at at a school there, and she vanished on Halloween. And two days later, she ends up dead in Baltimore. Mind you, she's this, like, suburban white teen, and she ends up dead in the ghetto. So where can we find this article? Detalkradio.com. The title is Annie McCann, A Death in Charm City. And what is the place where people can go to read your blog? Aurelia is blogging.wordpress.com. Very good, which we will also put a link in the show notes for that. <laughs>